All right. Wonderful. Um, well, this is a, a really a treat to be with you all today. Uh, three women whose work I admire uh, enormously. We are going to try to cover some significant ground um, around this sort of messy and important nexus of consumption, population, and the climate crisis. Um, the world continues to heat up. Climate impacts continue to unfold. Levels of consumption uh, seem to continue endlessly rising. Population continues to grow, as does wealth inequality. Uh, it's a lot and it's entangled. And we're going to try to unpack some of that, uh, aiming for both complexity and nuance, but also clarity and simplicity. So no small task. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, and let's, let's go ahead and, and dive in. Um, Juliet, help us just to start with, um, some, some definitions. The root of the word consumption I, I found really fascinating is about using up. It's about wasting. And I'm curious if there's an insight in that etymology and how your particular field of sociology can help us wrap our heads around uh, this, this term and this topic of consumption. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, there's also that association with uh, consumption, the disease uh, mm -hmm. that used to be called tuberculosis. I mean, consumption is what people used to call tuberculosis. Um, I think that there is uh, in the sort of pre-modern era an idea that consumption is a sort of wasting, a taking away, because uh, there was much more scarcity of consumer uh, consumables in those days. I, I can't even say consumer goods because, of course, they weren't called that. And it's not until uh, really the 20th century, in my view, many people would, would put it earlier, but in the 20th century, you get the rise of mass production and, and a level of use of the world's resources that just kind of uh, uh, leads to an explosion of consumer goods. And then again, you get this idea, the, this connection between waste and consumption as you know, increasing numbers of people understand that our way of life is so wasteful. And talk to us a little bit about um, kind of just how much of the earth uh, we are currently <laughs> using up um, year to year uh, and, and, and some of the impacts that's having. Well, if you look at the so uh, what's called the eco footprint measure, uh, and that is a consumption measure, it tries to figure out how much of the earth's resources um, biomass, uh, shallow seawater for fish, uh, and so forth, we use on an annual basis. We just, uh, um, in uh, early August, I believe, just passed the point in the year at which we had pretty much, we, we've used up what we have. And at this point, we go into what people call overshoot, or basically, um, using up some of the quote unquote natural capital. So running down an ecosystem. The biggest part of that at this point is uh, in the atmospheric system. And it's the uh, emission of greenhouse gases and CO2 in particular. And um, that what that's doing to planetary ecosystems. In the United States, uh, the carbon footprint is 70% of our footprint. That varies a lot by country. We'll get into that. The, you know, at the core of all of these issues is the concept of inequality. And if you approach these issues without putting that at the core, you get really distorted understandings. Um, so carbon use, for example, is very unequally distributed across countries and across people. Shaz, I'm 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 curious to get your sort of thoughts on um, again, get, kind of getting ready for this panel, uh, looking at some of the history. Right? Consumerism has only been with us relatively recently in in human history. Um, it seems to have had its roots in 
in in Northwestern Europe in the in the 18th century, but it's clearly now a very global phenomenon. And how do you how do you make sense of the the sort of spread um, and an attraction of of this consumer culture? Uh, that's a really interesting question, and it's kind of related to my background as well. So I grew up in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. And sort of overnight, in the span of a very short period of time, like let's say maybe 10 years or so, it went from being a desert to sort of a tourist hub. And so I got to see how uh, a location that was very natural at first became sort of very artificial and man-made very, very quickly. In terms of um, the, I'm not, I don't know that much about the history of consumption, but what I do know is the psychology of why people consume now. And so in general, um, individual satisfaction really depends not only on the on the level of consumption, but also the rate of change of consumption. So there have been uh, behavioral economists that show um, people want to consume more tomorrow than they do today. People mm -hmm. want increasing wage profiles and they also want increasing wage profiles compared to their peers. So, for example, if, I, if all of us in, were in the same institution, I'd want to make more than all of you. And so there's this sort of this deep psychological need that's sort of very tightly wound to marketing and to the consumer culture. So the question that I've been sort of thinking about is, are there ways to rethink capitalism altogether? And I think that that's sort of where a lot of people, uh, especially who I know in the climate change world, are starting to think about. And it's sort of a resurgence because we've had books like Small is Beautiful by E.F. Shoemaker a while ago. And so now we, we sort of really need to rethink how to untether consumption from growth and happiness and satisfaction from consumption, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And is, is part of that about having different ways of measuring what success is or, or, or looks like? I think so. And I've been trying personal experiments, but it's really hard. Um, and so everything that I've, I'm, I'm sort of taking this year off to try to figure out what are the mechanisms that we can use to get people to reimagine the future. Mm. And I think that there are many ways of reimagining the future. And I, I'm a huge sci-fi nerd. So I sort of take a lot of um, uh, inspiration from folks like Ursula Le Guin and Octavia Butler and Kim Stanley Robinson. And they could constantly reimagine through their writings social systems that have diff diff very different diverse economic systems where people seem really satisfied. And so I'm trying to play around with that idea um, in terms of how do people want to imagine a future where they're happier, that they're not so tethered to just consuming um, without taking care of both their spirit and their heart, as well as um, their connection with other people. Mm. It's, it's, it's really interesting, particularly Sherry, I, I think about um, so much of, of your work is, a, in, is about looking in many ways to the past and to wisdom that's been held for many generations um, as a way to look to the future. Um, and I, I thought another interesting piece of the etymology, which really had resonance to your work, I think, is that the, the word consume also means to destroy by separating into parts which cannot be united. Um, whereas simplicity has these uh, uh, has an etymology of wholeness and 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 unity and indivisibility, um, which I thought was a, just a fascinating contrast. Um, and I was wondering if you could sort of put this topic of consumption in uh, in, a, in a bit more of a, a spiritual context and, and, a, and a historical context. Uh, yeah, thank you, Catherine. I was thinking about, <clears throat> I'm glad that you're recording and you can edit that out. I'm getting over a terrible chest cold. Thinking about and talking about here while I've been at Omega, um, the uh, issue that we have with seeing ourselves in one of two ways. We either see ourselves as a consumer or as a commodity. And so we have um, been trained over millennia. The first uh, product to enter into the trade market was a female body in the form of land agreements that, that were 
uh, negotiated through the marriage of um, different female members of of um, the land based families, and so we've been we've been really tra- trained for the last five thousand years about ourselves as commodities, and so this this uh, issue of seeing ourselves as either a commodity or a consumer ties every bit of value that we assign to our lives to some type of consumptive practice. Mm -hmm. And when we think about the way that we assign value, how we derive value from um, the aspects of our lives that um, define who we are, our relationships with other human beings, um, the safety and security that we are experiencing, um, the ability to have safety and security within our own uh, homes. And all of those things, the value that we assign to them has been tied in some way to commodification or consumption. And so when we think about the fragmentation that's required for us to commodify ourselves, uh, we are not even coming into the discussion as whole human beings. So how do we commodify ourselves to sell ourselves to our family uh, so that our grandmother is happy with who we've become? How do we, uh, you know, market and sell ourselves to our friends so that we can be a part of a social network that we want to belong to? How do we sell ourselves to a potential employer, to a faith community, uh, even to a potential romantic partner? All of these different aspects of ourselves we've commodified and created into fragmented parts, which prevents us from even being able to enter into the discussion about consumption and fragmentation uh, about um, without being a whole person. And so we have to really go back to um, our basic value structure. How do we assign value? Uh, And I think it's also important to recognize not only the history of commodification of the human being as part of the consumptive market, uh, but also looking at what this inability to see our own value and the value of life beyond uh, capitalist system beyond this consumptive market, uh, and how that's impacting our ability to sustain our own lives on the planet. You know, human beings have been around for 200,000 years, but in the last 150 years, we've caused an equivalent amount of damage to the earth as was, um, caused throughout the entire, uh, existence of our species on the planet. And so there's an amplification and a progression that's going going on right now, a quickening uh, with the age of industrialism, with our ability to see one another in this way that we're experiencing right now for us to get our messages out to a broader audience, for us to be able to market the commodity that is us uh, in ways that was never available before, that's actually amplifying the harm that we're causing on the planet. And so, like you said, it's complex, it's interwoven, there's so many different aspects to it. Um, But it really comes down to the way that we assign value and how we value ourselves, how we value life, and how all of that value has been attached to a capitalistic, consumptive, and commodified Mm. system. Mm. And it sounds like, well, I'm curious, Shaz and Juliet, kind of what aspects of what Sherry shared um, you've you've found or or have resonance with with your work and, and how you've approached this topic? Well, I think for me, it's the development of highly unequal capitalist economies. Um, And, you know, that's been since the beginning of capitalism, but we've had ebbs and flows and levels of inequality. And depending on what what sort of units we're talking about, um, they that sort of consumption impulse, if you want to call it that, or, you know, what. Um, Charles was talking about with the behavioral economics findings, I think is really, really um, variable in terms over history, across places, people, etc. I mean, I don't agree with the point of view that it's something inherent in us. And I mean, that's also the, you know, sort of point of view of sociology, which is the discipline I went to after I left economics in part because I thought its ability to understand consumption was pretty limited. But it's it's in periods of high and also intensifying inequality, which does speak to that question about rate of change yeah. that, that Charles mentioned, 
um, that you get these really kind of intense, what I call consumption competitions, mm -hmm. when more and more of our sense of self gets wrapped up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as Sherry was talking about in what we have, what we can buy, what we put on our selves, what we can show to the world. And we've, we've, we've been in a period where that's really intense mm -hmm. in recent decades. And I do think that's very much connected with, to the growth of extreme inequality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to say, should, should we dig in there to the inequality piece and then, and then pick you back up, Shaz, or would you like to take it now? Uh, I'd like to just quickly jump in because uh, what Sherry said actually really resonated with me and I felt exceptionally uncomfortable with this commodification of ourselves and our information so much so that uh, this the past few months I've completely given up Facebook and LinkedIn because we have, I mean, these large information systems have started commodifying our information without necessary consent. And so I, there's something about that that I'm struggling with. And, and in, even in relation to a romantic partner, we're constantly sort of trying to sell ourselves to either other people, to our families. And I wish it, wa I wish it wasn't so. So I was wondering if Sherry had an idea of how to break that apart, besides just like, you know, just like completely, completely breaking apart capitalism. Um, I'd be open to hearing, uh, you know, just what that looks like, or maybe we'll get to it eventually. But um, I've been very deeply disturbed by that. And I'm trying to, again, change my own behavior based on this intense commodification of ourselves and who we are. Mm. Mm -hmm. Sherry, do you want to dig in on that now where we can come back, do, talk about sort of intervention well, solutions? Yeah, I just think I, that, you know, looking at it really quickly is um, impossible. And so it's really about us as individuals being willing to do the work to think about all the ways that we have sold ourselves and how that, that um, desire to be saleable has prevented us from discovering who we truly are. And I think that we all have this desire to know ourselves. We all have this desire to have this sense of belonging. We want to eliminate the separation between us and others. And we found avenues for that through the saleability of ourselves. Um, and the pain that's been caused by this um, kind of artificial and inferior sense of belonging that comes with saleability has created this incredible pain that people are now using consumption as an opiate to numb. And so it's just this vicious cycle that we're in. And so it's really about extracting our lives from the marketplace and getting to know who we are, how we assign value, how we have denied our own truth, uh, how we have um, hidden away the things that are most important to us in order to align ourselves with what's um, being promoted as most important within the popular culture. You know, looking at all of those different aspects. So it's not something that can be answered in a sound bite. It's really a thorough exploration of all areas of our lives and our own being that we have commodified and turned into a saleable product. You know, you talk about a romantic partner when when you're single people say you're on the market right even the way that we talk <laughs> about these things yeah. is connected yeah 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 I found it I found it really shocking um, that uh, that our global use of materials is outpacing both population growth and economic growth and it feels to me like that is sort of the engine of like spiritual desperation or something. Um, right. uh, uh, that's clearly the World Bank doesn't have that sort of data. But, um, uh, yeah, Juliet, could we, could yeah. we sort of dig in? Um, you know, clearly we are over consuming the earth, taking more than can be regenerated, generating more waste than can be metabolized by uh, li the living systems of the planet. Um, but also clearly not all consumption is created equal. Um, and some people are consuming wildly more and wildly differently um, than, than others. And I was hoping you could sort of tee up that, that critical variable of, of, of inequality. Yeah. So let me just start with a point about language. So even that language of we are consuming, that royal we, I think is pointing us in the wrong direction. 
Mm -hmm. um, I sometimes call it the POGO approach to climate change or ecological destruction from that old cartoon that said from POGO, we have met the enemy and he is us. And biology, economics, these are disciplines that have come at the problem in that way because they think about the average person. So that, you know, the famous iPad equation, impact equals population times affluence times technology, all people are treated, you know, it's the average person there. But so if we, if we sort of depart from that and think about the fact that consumption is, is so unequally distributed and impact is so unequally distributed. So for example, 10% of the world's population is responsible for about 45% of emissions. And about 60% of those people are in the global north. Um, the, the bottom half of the world's population is responsible for about 13, maybe about 15% of emissions. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's not a we problem. It's, you look at the footprints and people are starting to do really interesting work looking at the footprints of the really high emitters, uh, you know, people with the six, seven, eight figure incomes, and they're just, they have disproportionately high carbon footprints. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I think this should make our problem easier because it's less about everybody's behavior has to have a massive change. And yes, there's some of that, but really if we focus on where those disproportionalities are, it, it's, I, I think it's a more potent uh, approach. Mm. Sherry, is that, is that where we should focus our uh, sort of spiritual interventions um, uh, with, with that 10% that most affluent, most consumptive and highly emitting? Uh, well, well <clears throat> I guess I didn't realize I was going to be spiritual authority on this call and it's a <laughs> it's a role that's making me quite nervous Catherine um okay, well, you I can think that <laughs> at, any point, at any moment <laughs> um I think that what we uh need to think about is um how do we bring those who are the biggest power brokers on the planet to heal right we understand that these are the individuals who have been causing the greatest amount of harm. Um, we understand that there are certain practices um, that have lead, led to uh, the most consumptive trends that we've seen on the planet, and they're certainly associated with extreme wealth. And uh, the, the challenge in that is that uh, we have this tendency that uh, was referred to earlier about this competitiveness within um, this, this consumptive uh, marketplace where uh, people have this tendency to say, I want mine. And so what ends up happening is you have those who are in this top tier uh, consuming at these really high rates, and then they're disposing of the most wasteful, inefficient industrial or production uh, machinery and then the second tier people who haven't had access are then using that wasteful and inefficient um, machinery. And then it keeps going down through these, you know, imaginary hierarchical lines so that everybody wants the opportunity to have their right to be able to uh, consume and to pollute at the same rate that others have had. The right to have, and so it's not just a simple, a simple equation of having this this um, group of people who has been in the forefront of the destruction um, being able to have uh, their own uh, moral awakening about the harm that they're causing and the destruction to life that is resulting from that. A hundred million or a million species right now uh, on the verge of extinction, and they forgot to add human beings to that list. Um, so you also have to deal with the, in my mind, emotional and spiritual illness that consumption has become on the planet um, and how it has become a measure of success. 
that, um, that view of success. So, you know, when you have it moving from one tier to the next tier to the next tier, uh, with it being the most outdated, inefficient, destructive, polluting, um, machinery and mechanisms available to those who are gaining access to the, the toss offs, uh, then we have a much bigger problem. You know, we can bring those people, uh, to heal maybe, maybe not. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're still going to have to deal with this, this illusory, uh, trickle down effect of, um, those who can gain access to these outdated materials, gaining access to them and, um, utilizing them and adding to the destruction that's already been wrought. So it's, you know, it's complex and it's multi-layered. Yeah. Yeah. So just healing, um, uh, reforming capitalism, uh, uh, rooting out patriarchy. We, this, this will be, consumption will be easy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, I think it's this this point you made, Juliet, about the royal we um, is is really interesting uh, and and important. I think, and it it brings up for me also the um, well the problematic dynamic that it is oftentimes folks in that ten percent highest consumer category, highest emitter category. Um, who are also pointing to the issue of population um, as sort of the thing that's driving uh, driving environmental issues, um, the silver bullet, which of course, you know, we all know that there are, uh, alas, no silver bullets in, in any of this. Um, but Shaz, I was wondering if you could, could speak a little bit to kind of how, how you think we should frame or think about the dynamic of human population size and growth, given these issues of, um, of inequity in, in wealth and consumption and, uh, and, and carbon footprint, uh, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one of the most uh, powerful and disturbing talks I heard in the past year and a half has, was uh, one by an economist out of Berkeley named Emmanuel Says. And what he showed was data over time that looked at income inequality. And income inequality has just been increasing and increasing and increasing, even in the United States, like across the world, it's been increasing. And so what's really troubling about that is that, you know, people might argue, oh, you know, we have um, greater wealth now than we had in the past. But the problem is how we measure, um, how we measure the satisfaction and well-being of the person in our society that has the least should be sort of taken into consideration. And given that income inequality has grown so much, that's a very uh, disturbing trend for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I think focusing on population squarely is actually does not take the entire picture into account. Um, in my own research, we find that people really don't like talking about population control or they don't like sort of even touching that with a 10-foot pole. Even though um, a lot of people, especially even in the United States, um, uh, we actually can see a population uh, growth decline over time. So the number of of people being born, even though our overall population is increasing, the growth rate has been falling over time. And so that's actually a good trend. Um, But I think focusing just squarely on population, especially where you have population increases in the global south, is is sort of really murking the water. If you look at the top three countries in terms of population, it's China, India, and the United States. And we really should think about how to leapfrog a lot of the technologies that are in some of these countries into much more efficient ones so that we can actually achieve these stabilization wedges that Pakla and Sokolo a long time back have talked about. Um, And we should also sort of really think through um, how do we change our carbon footprint but one other trend that has been really disturbing to me in our in the climate change community is sort of pitting individual behavior against policy, that it has to be one or the other. And I think that you actually need both you need individual behavior change that then informs policy, because these are not separate things. Um, we need to encourage people to sort of march to the streets, become more active. And I think separating those and just saying, oh, we just need top down carbon taxes without anything else changing has been really problematic and has not worked in the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I really want us to think through a much more systematic 
change that involves all of these different systems as opposed to sort of saying, oh, it's just individual behavior or just policy, because in the past that has not worked. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's it's uh, it's a it's a really important um, it's a really important point and and sort of getting stuck in these is it consumption is it population is it individual behavior is it policy change and collective action like of course it is all of these these variables um, all all have have a role to play um, and yeah I you know I think it's it is worth just sort of noting that um, that in the process of moving the fundamental rights of women and girls forward, access to education, access to comprehensive voluntary reproductive health care, um, we see that women generally make the choice to have fewer children, to marry later. Um, and yeah, shockingly, it turns out that the choices that women uh, make about their own lives <laughs> turn out also to, to, to be good, um, you know, for, for the overall human family, um, and, and for the planet. Um, yeah. So just, uh, Jonathan, let's make sure that it <laughs> gets in the piece that, um, every woman should be able to decide if she wants to have children, when she wants to have children, how many children she wants to have, um, and to be able to do that in a way that is safe and healthy, um, and having a livable planet is, one piece of of true reproductive justice oh my god yes amen <laughs> so okay off the off the soapbox but i'm so so kind of what this left me thinking about was like is well is it is reducing wealth inequality a fundamental climate solution um is, is that sort of one of the takeaways we could derive from that 10 percent responsible for 50 percent uh of, of impact uh, sort of ratio? I would say 100%, just, just jumping in really quickly, um, because we're at the point now where we can't just be talking about mitigation alone. We have to start talking about adaptation. We have to, be, we have to start talking about resilience. And resilience matters most, not to the most wealthy, but it matters most to the least wealthy. And so unless we can get people who are the least wealthy to figure out how to adapt, with the funds that they need, with the programs that they need, we're sort of in a really shitty situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also believe that when we're dealing with inequality and we're looking at this incredible um, growth in income disparity, where the wealthier are getting wealthier and the poor are getting poorer, what it gives us is a distorted view of what the standard is. Uh, what is the standard? You know, when you have people who are extremely wealthy believing that, um, you know, the standard of living for the average person is a $250,000 a year income, um, the standard that we need to, uh, you know, survive, the standard that we believe in our minds we, we need to have in order to have enough becomes grossly distorted. And I, and I, you know, we have a lot of teachings about what we call the value of enough. Uh, what is enough to be able to sustain our lives with a sense of dignity and a certain degree of safety, right? And so looking at women, I mean, women um, have this inherent drive to ensure the protection of the continuity of life into the future, mm -hmm. right? It's not just the protection of life in the way that it has been co-opted and promoted, um, but it's the protection of the continuity of life into the future. And so the decisions that they make about the number of children that they're having, um, about what those children need in order to survive, mm -hmm. about what is required in order for us to ensure the continuation of life into the future, um, needs to become the standard that we're applying to the movement that we're um, taking going forward because the distorted image of what that standard is, that standard of, of enough based on, on this incredible disparity of inequity and wealth is that I see them way up there mm -hmm. and I want to get to this place. Um, and it completely distorts our, our um, understanding of what our real needs are. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of education about the distortion of the standard based on the the um, gross disparity in income levels is part of the process too, that we need to be um, really caricaturizing the inflated um, 
wealth that has led to the destruction of the planet and having that be looked at as a very unhealthy measure and start bringing that measurement back down so that we have a standard of living, a standard of equality, a standard of um, um, of wellness that's actually rooted in some form of wellness and mental uh, and social health. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think that that, that piece is, is really important because the evidence doesn't support the hypothesis that it's simply a population growth problem. Yeah. Um, you know, there's more evidence to support that it's as uh, growth in the disparity of, of income levels and the, the wealth gap that that is creating a distorted view that people are striving toward that's driving consumption. Yeah. And this, this ties really well to, to a question I wanted to ask you, Juliet. So I'll wrap that into any um, response, but when we, when we talk about consumption, there's sort of this implicit finger pointing towards individuals, right? Towards consumers. But of course there is no consumption without production. There are no consumers without corporations. Um, you know, and, and it makes sense that in the sustainable development goal 12, it's about ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns. So where should we really be, be pointing the finger here? Um, and, um, how should we think about that sort of chicken and egg, uh, kind of problem? Yeah. So if I could just say, I, I will answer that question. I just want to say one one thing about the conversation we were just having about inequality and its relationship to ecological degradation. Um, So I've done a series of papers looking at how domestic inequality affects carbon emissions. And one of the things we find is that when you have really highly concentrated income and wealth at the top, and we measure it, whether it's share of the top 10%, share of the top 5%, share of the top 1%, holding everything else equal, that leads to higher emissions. Mm-hmm. So it is it is inequality, but it's also a particular type, you know, what we call extreme inequality today, but the kind of inequality at the very top, that concentration at the top, that is particularly per- pernicious from the point of view of carbon impacts. Mm-hmm. Um, so just to really agree with what, you know, everyone else was saying on that. So the chicken and egg question is really interesting because, you know, on the one hand, you can say it's a system. Every point in the system matters. There are leverage points everywhere. And that's all true. But as someone who has studied the relationship between consumption and and sort of system change for a long time, one of the things I think that's really important to understand is that consumers are not the leading agents of our of our system. They are much more, I don't want to say passive, they're, they more just kind of like go with the flow. And um, they, don't, they don't have the power that drives the system. Sherry was talking about that earlier, the people with power. Um, occasionally they revolt. You know, the most famous example, which marketers always point to, it's really old now because there aren't that many examples, was New Coke. People rebelled when Coke tried to put out a new formula. But for the most part, they're going to be going along with it. So they adapt to what the system, the the production system is offering. And the key point here is that the, the, the level or the scale of ecological and climate degradation is in large part driven by the scale of production. And Mm -hmm. we produce the money goes to people. All of the dynamics that we've been talking about, you know, that Sherry's been talking about and so forth, those dynamics are set into play by that flow of income or sometimes credit, you know, because credit is also uh, behind the the, uh, consumption system. So I think that it's really important. Sometimes consumption is a way in because it's, it's personal for people. They relate to it. I've done work that shows that people who start to change their lifestyles get more politically active and do stuff about, you know, the the way the consumption system is affecting the planet and people. Um, But let's not forget, it's 100, just a mere 100 companies that account for more than 70% of all the carbon pollution in the world. They are driving this. It, it's those elites that are driving the system. 
not the ordinary person who's just trying responding in a world which says consumption is what matters. Yeah, we you you raised up that wonderful quote um, at the end of Leah Stokes' recent piece in The Guardian um, that fighting the climate crisis is not about purifying yourself. It's about dismantling corporate power. Um, and, you know, my take is maybe it's a bit about both. Right? It may be about healing some of those deeper dynamics that, that we talked about, but certainly not. Um, there's no way to better consume our way to to a solution. Um, there, it's it it has got to be about going after um, the the real roots of 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 the causes of of this crisis. And um, yeah, Shaz, I, I feel like say one thing on that because, yeah. and this is back to the royal we and all that. It's not that we have failed. I mean, yes, on some level, but it's that. You have a group of people who are basically taking the planet into ecocide so they can make money and hold on to power. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not that just somehow we are morally failing. Yeah. And I think, you know, we have seen that language crop up a lot, in, especially in the last year. Um, the uh, whose piece was it? Um, uh, in the New York Times magazine, you know, it's human nature that's failed us. And it's like, well, it's not all of human nature, clearly, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I love Mary uh, Anais Hegler had a wonderful piece recently um, in Vox getting at, at some of these dynamics. And um, this great quote from her, the belief that this enormous existential problem could have been fixed if all of us had just tweaked our consumptive habits is not only preposterous, it's dangerous. It turns environmentalism into an individual choice defined as sin or virtue, convicting those who don't or can't uphold these ethics. When you consider that the vast majority of, of greenhouse gas emissions come from just a handful of corporations aided and abetted by the world's most powerful governments, including the US, it's victim blaming plain and simple. We need to broaden our definition of personal action beyond what we buy or use. Um, and I thought that framing of it's, it is, it is about undercutting, I think, um, sort of people power, but that sense that it is victim blaming, I found a, a really, really powerful, um, insight as well. We've assigned that piece to our students for our upcoming. Oh, week. nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but Shaz, you know, you 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 deal with this relationship um, between individual kind of personal choice and and more systemic change. Um, I feel like we should would turn this over to you for a minute for for reflections on on that on that kind of nexus of those things. In general, um, I think uh, people collectively are far 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 more powerful than they realize, mm -hmm. and we're starting to see that in action with both the Sunrise Movement right now, with the excitement around the Green New Deal. Um, and so when a lot of my own work looks at how individual behavior sort of le uh, facilitates um, changes in policy support, and what we found is that people, um, our participants for our studies, they really want to know how to do uh, what we're trying to create. Um, so, for example, um, uh, a lot of climate change scientists have a very large carbon footprint because we fly a lot uh, in terms of like in my total carbon footprint, flying sort of dominates. Um, and so what we did was we experimentally tested how having different carbon footprints affects policy support. Mm -hmm. And people have much stronger oh. policy support when your communicator, your climate communicator has a smaller footprint than if your communicator has a higher footprint. So in, in general, what we find is people really want to see how to be the change, how to sort of dream of this new future, and they're willing to come along. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm really interested in looking at is sort of unleashing the power of narrative and the power of collective action, as opposed to sort of just looking at it from an individual behavior or uh, a simple policy instrument coming in and just sort of trying to revolutionize everything. Because again, that has just not worked as yet.
Mm. And so how do we leverage collective action? And sort of one point of inspiration for me, and as I said, I'm, I'm from Indiana University, has been the work of Lynn Ostrom. And she's the only woman to have ever won a Nobel in economics. And what she showed is that small groups of people can self-police. They can actually, it's not, not a tragedy of the commons, it's a drama of the commons. So people can come together and sort of self-regulate. So the question is, how do we do that when your N, when your sample, when your number of people is really, really large? And I think that's sort of um, a challenging research question. Mm. Whoever's listening, if you can solve it, that would be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm curious as you go sort of hunting and, and looking deeper into narratives, um, what you what if, what you may come across that um, sort of are our stories of that value of enough um, that that Sherry talked about or or that transition from from more to better um, or, or some such. Yeah, me too. Um, so far, I've been sort of talking to a lot of writers and um, storytellers, and stories are really powerful because we're all humans of stories. Like, we love stories. The way we even communicate science is through stories. And so um, trying to actually unleash the power of narrative to create a mobilized change in our system would be really powerful, and it's happened in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to just see how that unfolds for the climate change uh, movement. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I've been really, I've been really struck recently by um, how many folks, even sort of within the climate space or climate movement, um, still very much buy into the economic story of growth forever and ever. Amen. Um, and yeah, Juliet Cherry, I would love for either of you to weigh in there. I mean, it just seems, you know, it seems like a pretty simple sort of logical thing to think through that, you know, if, if the sources of economic growth are basically human capital and natural capital, and we know we're expending natural capital wildly and human capital is not infinite, I mean, how can, how can growth even sort of plausibly continue forever? Um, and, and how might we, we need to rethink that, that, that concept? Julia, go ahead and answer that first. <laughs> okay. So um, there's no question that the rapid growth of the last, you know, roughly 70 years, especially what they call the Great Acceleration, the post-World War II period has been sort of monumentally devastating for the planet. Uh, it, it's what put us into the Anthropocene, you know, the era in which humans are actually changing the basic chemistry um, of, the, of the planet. Um, so the one of the things that's happened is that growth went from being something that you could plausibly argue was pretty much good for everyone, and especially those people at the bottom that Jazz was talking about earlier. In the post-World War II, the couple of decades after the post-World uh, War II, growth was, uh, it, it led to more equality. It lifted people up. Mm -hmm. um, and beginning around in the 1980s, and this is true, you know, around the world, growth starts to do the opposite. So it's immiserating growth. It's growth that's creating more inequality. And of course, all of that growth is, you know, ecologically very destructive. So the, we're still trapped in the view that says growth is going to solve our problems. But that's a view that's decades out of date. And I think one of, to me, one of the most interesting things about the way politics in the United States has changed and the way it's changing in some other places too, and the Green New Deal is a great example of this, is that it is no longer so growth centric. It is saying, okay, what do human beings need? We need education, we need healthcare, we need security, we need housing, we need a clean environment, we need a safe climate. Let's focus on getting those. Green New Deal does not say, let's gin up the economy and hope that rising tide lifts all boats or, or people will get jobs. It says we're going to give them jobs and we're going to give them decent uh, wages and so forth. And so moving from a growth centric approach 
so let's call it a need centric or a human centric is really, really important. Mm. <clears throat> when I think about um, what we really need right now in um, regard to the common agreements that have led us to the place that we're in. I think that one of the most important things it, that we have to do is we have to be able and willing to change our thinking about certain um, entrenched beliefs that we have adopted throughout the entire era of this colonial patriarchal capitalistic system. Uh, one of those beliefs is the um, belief that someone else will come and solve the problem. And so we have uh, in, entrenched in patriarchy, entrenched in, col in colonialism, is this notion of childlike dependence. And so we have this childlike dependence and a sense of entitlement to have someone else solve our problems. Mm -hmm. And um, that means that we settle for the solutions that are offered to us uh, you, you know, we have this illusion of choice. Okay. You choose a, or you choose B. And so it's also entrenched us into this binary thinking pattern where, um, we think that it's this or it's that there's one big solution to the problem. And so, so it, it's prevented us from recognizing that we have arrived in this place by, by common agreement. Everyone has participated, even if they've participated um, through passivity, complacency, complicity, going with the flow, as Julia said earlier, um, that their common agreement actually start taking responsibility for the state of our world um, by moving beyond this childlike dependence, moving beyond this binary thinking, recognizing that it's going to be a whole number of smaller, localized, communal initiatives that are going to actually move us in the direction that we want to go in. It's really a radical change in thinking. It's about us being able to break out of, um, you know, the reservation of the mind and uh, start breaking free from these illusions that we've been fed and bought wholesale and um, really freeing ourselves to think more creatively and more critically about the systems that we've developed collectively. Mm. And, and, and kind of where do you all think we're seeing, seeing footholds? Where are we seeing uh, kind of things in motion that may give us a glimpse into what's possible for the future? Um, there's a, a, a lot to feel pretty bleak about, I think, in this moment, but uh, surely there are some bright spots that we might, <laughs> might look to and, and learn from. Curious what you all have kind of come across in your work. I can go first on this if you'd like. I think that the most hopeful thing that I have seen is a real willing, willingness in a lot of the younger people that I come in contact with to kind of forego the status quo pathway. Mm -hmm. They are not only willing but desiring to live with much less. They mm -hmm. are kind of turning their backs on austerity. They're, um, you know, like moving away from the pathway that others have always told them is the pathway to success. There's been a, an uptick in um, communal living. There's been a movement toward re-ruralization. You know, before everybody wanted to escape to the cities, now people are getting back to the land and there's a lot, uh, a growth of um, small local farms and um, uh, this communal sharing that's starting to crop up. And it's, it's not just on the fringes anymore, it's starting to move into the mainstream. Um, and, and to me, that's probably one of the most encouraging trends is that uh, people are turning their back on this extreme, unending pursuit of growth and wealth and acquisition. I can piggyback off of that. Um, so what I found very sort of hopeful um, and inspiring is sort of the youth movement around climate change. Uh, that includes the Sunrise Movement, that includes marches, um, uh, sort of, and I think that in itself is really powerful. And um, the second thing that I find really powerful is 
actually there are three things, uh, is my students, a lot of them are becoming much more politically active. I just had a student run for city council because he really wants climate change to be a front agenda item for Bloomington, Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really exciting. He won. Um, what else I find exciting is there's also a growing feminist movement around climate change. So more women in the field of art, science, activism, uh, journalism, sort of really pushing the boundaries of trying to take back the conversation and trying to sort of own parts of the solution that have in the past not been ours or that have been stolen from us. So for me, I find, um, I find hope in the multitude of voices as opposed to sort of the, um, you know, the, the idea that everything is sort of uh, 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 just mainstream ideas because I don't think everything that we've been sort of talking about uh, has sort of come to fruition. And I think we need to sort of break that apart and rethink solutions. Mm -hmm. So I find hope in those three things. Mm. Um, 10 years ago, the financial collapse and the recession that ensued really set us back a lot. Um, and I would say that I think in the last year or so, I mean, it's been building in the last couple of years, but in the last year or so, the resistance to the fossil fuel uh, industry and our dependence and our destructive way of life, I think has really just exploded. And, you know, we've been talking about sunrise and young people and they've been at the vanguard, but it, it's, it's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the, both the industry, the politicians and, you know, everyone associated with the status quo and trying to prevent serious action on climate um, is on the defensive. And that's, a, it's, it's just a, a really much better way to be. We're winning lawsuits. The industry's, you know, losing in court um, and questions of damages. And we're not there yet. But the fact that when Trump got elected president, that the fossil fuel <laughs> polluters thought they had to, like, directly move into the government to take it over, I think, in many ways, is an, is testament to how powerful the opposition has become. And it is it is now common sense that we are going to go get off fossil fuels. That was unthinkable even five years ago. So I don't know if we're going to, you know, be able to expand and become powerful enough, you know, in, in, in a time, in a, in, um, in a period of time that that would allow us to avoid like some of the really horrific things that we're facing, um, you know, that process that Sherry talked about can be a slow process, um, but it's, we're in a way better position than we were five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have one more thing I want to add that I just think uh, from my own perspective is really encouraging because, um, you know, indigenous peoples have been the ones that all others have uh, kind of elevated themselves against in this race towards the bottom that we're uh, involved in. And uh, what's really encouraging to me in the work that I do is seeing that there is now an international recognition that the protection of indigenous lands is synonymous with the protection of the planet. And so um, people understanding that shows me that there's a real cultural shift away from um, the ways of thinking that have led us to the place that we're at and moving back towards a more harmonious and balanced relationship with not only the earth, but peoples of the earth. So um, to me, that's very encouraging as well. Mm -hmm. Here, here. Yeah, here, here. Um, I wanted to bring in sort of one, one other uh, uh, woman who's not with us today, but I think Emily Atkin has done some great sort of writing about um, this nexus of climate crisis and consumer culture um, and, and being honest, I think, about the thing that sometimes people don't want to say, which is like there, there will be individual, quote unquote, sacrifice in this, right? In the sense that um, for those of us in a higher consuming um, uh, culture or, or socioeconomic uh, status, there will have to be less flying. There will have to be 
less Ubering. <laughs> there will have to be less red meat eating, um, less wasting of food, less buying of things that we don't really need. Um, but in that quote unquote sacrifice, we may actually find that, that it is not a sacrifice at all, right? That, that in some ways the, the sort of pl the planet may be um, forcing us into kind of an emotional, psychological, spiritual evolution, um, simply, mm -hmm. simply out of necessity um, and, um, and, and a sense of, of, of limits. Um, yeah, we, we, we've covered a lot of ground, um, mostly relatively lightly. Um, is there anywhere else you all want to add kind of a bit more depth or, 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 or examples or nuance? Um, and also any, any action steps you might leave folks with um, for, for, for personal and, and systemic change? I just want to say that I don't have a whole ton more time um, just because I'm in the midst of hosting a bunch of people here in this, in this workshop here at Omega. So um, thank you for squeezing us in Sherry. It's been wonderful to have this conversation with you. Phenomenal human beings. Yeah. Oh, it's been amazing to meet you. I will give the action step of go to a workshop with Sherry, if at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the action step is really to start looking at the ways that you've commodified your uh, individual being in your life and how can you start moving back towards wholeness? Because what you're talking about in regard to the planet is forcing us to uh, change the way that we're living. The planet is forcing us back into relationship with the source of our life. Uh, so if, you know, if we're uh, less able to engage in all of these forms of escapism, uh, which the majority of our life has become, um, then we're going to be forced to move into a deeper relationship with the people in our community. We're going to be forced to move into deeper relationship with the, um, the places that we live in relationship with, you know, for me, when I say, you know, who am I and where I from, I answer with one word, but no because I recognize my connection to place and how that sustains the life that I lived. And so I think that that for me is, is probably the primary action step for individuals to take is to begin that process because that leads you to all the places where you're out of balance and lets you see what the work is that needs to be done in your life, in your community, in your organization, your political system, you know, what have you. So that sounds great. I was becoming more politically active, both locally and nationally. I think that has a, has the ability to make a huge difference. Sort of believing in the power of the individual, especially in collection. Um, a lot of my own work has looked at what are effective actions people can take to decrease their energy use and water use. All of those are freely and open sourced, open available. Um, knowing where your carbon footprint has the largest impact and trying to actually make individual um, changes to yourself and also spreading those changes to others in your community. I think all of that, especially in aggregate, can have can make a huge difference. Mm. Um, so sort of realizing and understanding, learning where you have the most impact, both in terms of community, but also in terms of the environment. And I just say... Do the things that these brilliant women have just been talking about and join your local or statewide climate group and give them give it all all that you can yeah i think you know we've had so much uh there's been so much talk recently about climate grief or climate anxiety or whatever pick your <laughs> pick your hard emotion. Um, and, and the only thing to me that, that seems to make a difference is to hold that emotion in community um, and, and in collective um, to sort of surrender to it and, and then r rise back into to shaping the future that, that we want. Um, and yeah, this, this, this conversation for me just affirms that um, yeah, that, that, that women and girls have a particularly important vision and voice um, in, in this moment and um, just so much admiration and respect uh, for, for all three of you and gratitude for, for taking the time. And for all Thank of you, you. Catherine. Yeah. Yeah.
Thank you all. Yeah. Such a pleasure to meet you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much.